A no-fly zone in Ukraine? Not so fast. The breakdown starts now. Good evening and welcome to The Breakdown. I'm Tara Setmayer. The Rick Wilson is off tonight. He's traveling. So it's just me and you, but we have an awesome guest for you tonight. My good friend, friend of the show, retired General Mark Hurtling is with us. You've probably seen him on CNN. You've read his tweets. He is an amazing, amazing, he has amazing insight into what's going on given his 40 years in the military. Um, And he has some things to say. And I know that a lot of people have asked the question about why can't we just fill in the blank? No fly zone. Why can't we just bomb the convoy? Why can't we just, well, guess what? General Hurtling is going to be here with me in a little bit to explain some of the military strategy and what's happening on the ground as we watch this horrific scene unfold with this Putin invasion of Ukraine. So stay tuned for him. But first, I also want to say, Happy International Women's Day to all the kick-ass women out there, not only in the U.S., but also over there in Ukraine. I dedicate this International Women's Day to the women in Ukraine, the mothers in Ukraine who are sacrificing to protect their children. And you know what? To the mothers in Russia whose sons are being sent over to Ukraine um, for Putin's vanity. And uh, it's sad. So we're dedicating International Women's Day to them. At least I am. And before we get to the headlines, what do we do on Tuesdays? It's last week in the Republican Party. Check it out. They didn't do this on Trump's watch, Russia, because Trump would have kicked their ass. If Bill Barr would have filed the law in 2020 and would have stood up for election integrity, President Trump would still be in the White House. And if President Trump was still in the White House today, we would not have this conflict in Ukraine. By the way, Donald Trump really won 82 million to 67 million. That's the real total. You ever see what happens in Los Angeles where hundreds and thousands of tons of China garbage is floating the tides? Bring it right. So we have nice, clean water, wow. and you're not allowed to put your toe in the water, and yet you have 25,000 tons of garbage flowing in from China. Joe Biden is the Kurt Cobain of politics. He put a shotgun in the mouth of the American body politic, and the brains are on the wall. So it might be time for Joe Biden to let us know what Kentaji Brown Jackson's LSAT score was. Joe Biden found that standing for Ukraine was a really great applause line. So he just kept at it. When you say go get him, it's like an exit line. But when you say go get him, I know. it makes you think like, okay. Specific. He I emphasized the H, but if I was a Benton woman, I would say he meant to say, go get him. I agree with you. Yes. But right. it's the State of the Union, so he's going to pronounce every part of every word. All the, the syllables. Is- America's getting much dirtier, and there are like dollar stores everywhere, and people litter. So if you cared about the environment, maybe you'd clean up the environment, but instead they're lecturing us about climate. You do not have to wear those masks. I mean, please take them off. <laughs> Honestly, it's not doing anything. The best is Ron DeSantis saying those kids, get your masks off. I love that. People are all upset about Ron DeSantis. The beloved- The insanity continues. Every week, we marvel at the absolute absurdity of these people, but they live among us. Some of them are in power. Some of them would like to be in the majority in the House of Representatives or the Senate. We cannot let them. These people are Looney Tunes. Um, The trucker thing, I'm going to talk about that in a second, because I live in the Washington, D.C. area, and I'm telling you, that thing has been a complete dud. But I'm going to get to that in a second, because there's some bigger news today before we get to Ukraine as well. Uh, Some January 6th updates there has actually been a conviction, the first conviction of a January 6th conspirator. Uh, This guy, his name is literally Guy, Guy Refit. He's 49 years old. He's part of the three percenters. They're one of the militia groups like the Oath Keepers. These are bad dudes. And uh, he was one of the recruiters of the three percenters. Now, he didn't actually enter the Capitol, but 
he was convicted of a bunch of charges, a slew of them, five of them, including impeding an official proceeding, which is that federal statute that we've been talking about that, um, it, uh, you know, it has up to 20 years in prison. It's not a joke. What he did was he was outside and he was one of the first people to um, break through the police barrier and encourage others to overrun the Capitol Police that day. Not only that, he was armed to the teeth, which is what happened to the, oh, I thought no one there. It was a bunch of peaceful tourists that were just there. Apparently not, according to the law. And according to this guy's own testimony, because of course, like the dumbasses that most of them are, he was on social media recording himself before and after, basically admitting what he did. Um, according to the uh, U.S. attorney who prosecuted him, quote, on January 6th, Guy Rafit challenged the police at the head of a vigilante mob determined to break into the Capitol. He did this because he wanted to, quote, take out Congress and an angry, energized crowd gave him his best shot at it. Yeah, this guy. What was he? What was he caught with? He's by, he's from Texas, by the way. He's forty nine. He had an AR fifteen style rifle, a semi automatic handgun. He went to the Capitol in what he called quote full battle rattle, including a handgun, helmet, body armor, radio, and flex cuffs. I don't know about you. I've been a tourist in lots of places. I don't bring that stuff with me. So that's that. Now the other thing that happened today. Um, Enrico Tario, remember this guy? He's one of the proud boys. He's been in and out of trouble, this Enrico, Enrique, I mean, Tario. And now he's another person charged with seditious conspiracy. This is interesting because um, the proud boys, he's the first one of them. The Oath Keepers have been charged with seditious conspiracy, but this guy uh, is being charged with conspiracy now. And why is that? Well, Enrique, was, an all, was also not inside the Capitol that day, but it didn't matter because it seems as though the feds have found out he was in cahoots with the Oath Keepers. Stuart Rhodes, the guy that's the head of the Oath Keepers, he's the other really bad hombre. Um, he was in contact with this guy on January 5th. Now, Enrique Tario had gotten in trouble for vandalizing a church that had a Black Lives Matter um, banner in front of it and got in trouble for that. And he was not supposed to be inside DC city limits. But he was. He violated that on January 5th. And he met with Stuart Rhodes. And they also found that he had exchanged messages with someone else, a conspirator, uh, violent messages about uh, violence against the Capitol that day. So Enrique Tario, he's in trouble. And this is also the first time that we've seen that the militia groups have been in coordination with each other, which is another interesting aspect of this whole thing to pay attention to. Um, once again, not a freaking tourist visit. So we'll keep an eye on that. Enrique, he's in trouble. Um, he did more than stand back and stand by. So the stupid convoy. Um, my husband, as a federal law enforcement officer, was impacted by this. Um, the federal agencies in the D.C. area were taking it seriously. Uh, there was actually a bolo alert out about some the violent ex militia extremists that were part of this convoy and they'd been spotted at various points and to keep an eye out for them. Um, but it ended up really being a dud. And the interesting thing about this is that these guys, they, there's about 10 of them. <laughs> they went up to Capitol Hill to meet with lawmakers to, you know, so they could hear their demands. They can, you know, want to make their demands. There were 10 of them. I counted in the room. There were literally more, media folks there than there were truckers in this freedom convoy. Um, it was, there really wasn't that much disruption on the beltway. Uh, they had a couple trucks and drove around the beltway a couple times. And I don't know what they think they're going to accomplish with this, given that gas prices are over $4 a gallon. And, um, these people have jobs, I'm assuming. I don't know. It's going to be an expensive asinine thing for them to circle the beltway, just to basically scream into the wind. So, of course, who did they meet with? Ted Cruz, I roll, Ron Johnson, Marjorie Taylor Greene. The usual suspects are the only ones that gave these idiots an audience. And they're demanding an end to vaccine mandates and masking where most states have already done this. So they're a little late to the party, no? Oh, for God's sakes. Um, there was an article in Vice that they were complaining that, that Ukraine was getting all the attention. And that no one's paying attention to them now because of Ukraine, but their fight for freedom, their fight for their fight for freedom against masks and mandates is 
equivalent to the fight for freedom with the folks in Ukraine. No, it's not. Get the hell out of here with that. It's the same thing. These people in Ukraine are literally fighting for their lives, escaping bombs and shelling and artillery from a major army. It is not the same thing. An army that is invading their their free, fair country and their right to self-determination is what these people are fighting for. It's not the same as a bunch of quacks that are whining and, and driving their big trucks around to get attention about masks and vaccines. Stop it. Stop it. And that's why no one's paying attention to you, because it's asinine. Um, what's not asinine is what's going on in Ukraine. And um, I have to say that some of the reports of, of 2 million refugees now have escaped Ukraine, 1 million children. We are looking at a certified humanitarian disaster here. Um, this is a crisis. And kudos to the countries in the surrounding areas like Poland and Moldova, Romania, um, that are taking in these refugees. But this is really, really, really serious. And we're, we're watching these heartbreaking images every day on our television. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's tough. But what's encouraging is the spirit of the Ukrainians. It has not been broken. Zelensky has been out there um, virtually every day standing up for his country. Um, Spitting in the face of Putin and their and his his troops there that are trying to take him out. He's escaped assassination attempts. They've thwarted them uh, three times, from what I understand. So um, Zelensky gave a Churchill esque address to the UK Parliament today, which I encourage folks to go watch if you haven't. Um, this guy is a hero, man. No matter what happens here, he's going to go down in history as uh, as a hero of his, of his country. And this is um, something that. I think we as Americans are watching, wondering, how does this end? What are we going to do? Um, what is Russia doing? Well, guess what? American companies are stepping up. We've been hearing uh, Joe Biden, thankfully today, finally came out and said, we're cutting any Russian ro oil imports, oil and gas, no more. That's over, uh, which is a good thing. That's squeezing Russia's biggest weapon, biggest asset, basically weaponizing it against them. Now we have to see what happens in Europe. We take very small amounts of Russian oil and gas, very, very small imports. It's Europe that is impacted by this the most. So European, some European countries have over 70% of their, um, of their oil and gas comes from Russia. And so it's a little more difficult for them to say, you know, we're done with you. Um, but Biden's done an excellent job of keeping this European uh, alliance together. I'm going to talk to, to General Hurtling about that in a second. Um, also, I want to say kudos to the Russians that are protesting against Putin. He's having problems back home. 16,000 Russians have been detained for protesting this war uh, against this war in Ukraine. That's an extraordinary number, knowing that what happens when you speak out against the Russian government, against Putin, you risk being disappeared. So there is the, the scenes of support for the Ukrainians across European capitals has been pretty extraordinary. And I'm, I'm encouraged by that. American companies, as I said, stepping up. I have a little list here of some of the major companies that are ceasing operations or uh, not supplying uh, supplies anymore to them. We've got BP, Exxon, Shell. They have all done either pulled out of oil and gas projects or ceased uh, operations or are about to because you can't just kind of turn the spigot off. But they're on board with that. Boeing and Airbus, which is interesting because... The Russian military has right now 62 planes on orders with both of those manufacturers. And Russia doesn't actually own a lot of the planes that they have. They lease them and they can't get the parts. I'm going to ask General Hurtling about that, too. I read in, in depth about how this is now the longer this goes on, the more this becomes a supply challenge for the Russians because they can't get parts from these places or the manuals to fix the planes. So there's that. Then we also have Starbucks, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Unilever. Uh, they've all ceased operations in some capacity. Payment processors, Visa, Amex, Discover, MasterCard. So you can't do bank transactions. They have to depend now on Chinese processors to exchange money, to pay for things. Imagine that that happened here. Visa, MasterCard, Amex, they basically run everything when it comes to ATMs, when you want to pay with your debit card. That's harder now for the Russians. You've got Google, Facebook, TikTok. They're kicking off the Russians. Airbnb, Disney, Netflix, Apple, H&M, 
Adidas, Puma, Ikea, <laughs> uh, Ferrari. Oh, sorry, oligarchs. You can't buy your Ferraris. Ford, Harley Davidson, Mercedes Benz, Toyota, Volkswagen, and FedEx and UPS are ceasing operations in and out of Russia. So that is a quite an extensive list. So these sanctions, when people say, oh, sanctions, who cares? This is unprecedented in what's happening. And I'm glad to see American companies stepping up and doing the right thing as well. So the righteous anger of the American people, I say it all the time, when it's put together collectively for good, it can make a difference. And these companies are an example of that. So with that said, let's talk a little military strategy and bring in my good friend, retired General Mark Hurtling. Now, for those who don't know General Hurtling, um, he is he spent four decades in the U.S. Army when he retired. He commanded the U.S. Army Europe and 7th Army, where he led over 40,000 soldiers, cared for over 100,000 family members, and partnered with the armies of 50 countries in European theater. So I'd say, Mark, you know a thing or two. And I can call you Marcus for friends. I've already gone through this. So don't yell at me, folks, for not calling him general. <laughs> All right, the first thing I'm going to ask you, Tara, though, since it's International Women's Day, congratulations. And are you getting paid the same amount as Rick Wilson is? <laughs> and if not, I'm going to protest that, okay? Um, I, I think you can be quite, quite satisfied with, with the way I'm treated as the Lincoln Project. They okay. believe in equal pay. <laughs> Okay. Great. What, we'll what do we want to talk about tonight? <laughs> um, so, Mark, looking at what's happening on the ground, I know the American people have a lot of questions. Let's start with what's your assessment of where we're at right now in this theater of war? Um, well, you know, when you're a professional soldier, what you try and do, Tara, especially at the senior ranks, is you break things down between the strategy of the operation, something that's called the operational art, what are the generals doing in the field to, to reach the political strategy, and then there's the, the tactics. So Putin went into this with the strategy, the overarching strategy of number one, subjugating Ukraine, number two, uh, continuing to divide NATO, number three, continuing to divide what he thought was already a broken and, and divided United States, and number four, increasing his economic potential. Uh, through the Nord Stream pipeline and and selling oil and basically hijacking Europe. Mm -hmm. He has failed in reaching all four of those objectives. And what I would suggest is it's not just a temporary fa failure, it will be a long-term failure, which in a minute I'll explain why that might be problematic. So then you say, okay, how do you achieve those objectives? Well, you put a military in the field to do something. And the art of the generals is something called operational art, planning the battles, mm -hmm doing the things that support the battles, uh, ha having the overarching approach and processes to make sure the strategic objectives are met on the battlefield. Well, uh, I can kind of evaluate the Russian generals because I've seen them on multiple occasions during exercise. And what I would suggest, at least at this point in time, it appears like they're failing miserably. And I've said this from the very beginning. Their plan is awful. Uh, they are not keeping it simple, which is a, a principle of war. They are not executing a good maneuver. They're just driving over things. Uh, their surprise has been taken away by the Biden administration because we've, we've notified the world of what they were attempting to do before mm -hmm. they did it with some of the false flag operations. Uh, and most importantly, their logistics has not supported their, their operations. That is the art of the generals. It, right. it, you know, in fact, they, they teach us at the War College, uh, amateur study tactics, professional study logistics. And the Russian army does not have a whole lot of professionals in their force. Okay, so those are the top two. Sure. The bottom part are the battles, where the battles take place. And, you know, there, there were multiple times when I was commanding in Europe that I saw the Russian military conduct training events, conduct exercises. And I always kind of looked at them askance and said, this is not a very good army. Uh, <laughs> their soldiers are not trained. They don't have a sergeant's corps, an NCO corps to lead them. Their I, junior I officers that. are terrible. Um, they don't have the support from their government because it's mostly uh, based on corruption. Uh, their generals are uncaring. They don't care about the troops. So on, so on, so on. They, they get to, as an example, their tank corps gets to fire one tank round a year. And by the way, it's a conscription force, which means 
they're in for a year or a two year draft as opposed to a professional military like ours are. Okay, let's shift to the other side now. Uh, now you could you could talk about <laughs> the same thing for the Ukrainian army. Their strategic objective is to survive as a nation and to protect their capital, uh, their center of gravity. Their operations are being conducted by not only generals who have been, their army has been somewhat, uh, they've, they've gotten rid of all the old Soviet generals that used to be mm -hmm. in their force when they were in the Warsaw Pact. And what I have seen from about the year 2004, when I first ran into a Ukrainian soldier on the battlefield of Iraq, where they were absolutely horrible and, and just corrupt, untrained, undisciplined, they have gone through a metamorphosis where their military is in, is in exceedingly good shape. And in fact, why? The U.S. military, why? Yeah. Well, part of the reason why is because uh, as they volunteered for missions to try and get into to NATO, that was part of their action plan to get into NATO, we started training with them, both their Air Force and their Army. So my last couple of tours in, in Europe, as I was going back and forth between Europe and Iraq, I engaged personally, as did many of my soldiers, with the Ukrainian Army. Mm -hmm. We conducted exercises with them, training with them. I had a sergeant major by the name of Davenport who talked their sergeant major into developing an NCO Corps in the Ukrainian army. And that makes a world of difference. Learning the mistakes even, of the Russian army of not yeah. having an NCO Corps, yeah. And we even started bringing their, their colonels to a place called Grafenbeer in Germany, where we taught a mini war college course to colonels to teach them the operational art. Some of those colonels are now generals. Uh, so what you've seen over the last 15 years in the Ukrainian army is a true transformation. Their, their chief of their general staff was a guy named Mikhaila Vorobyov, who was a good partner of mine. You know, we were partners with the different European armies. And Vorobyov was a smart guy. He, we, he and I uh, had several beers together and a lot of vodka as well. And he would talk about what he wanted to do to bring his military into the 21st century. Unfortunately, General Vorobyov died of cancer a couple of years ago uh, after teaching at their war college. But he was a guy that I attribute much of the change to in the Ukrainian army. But the bottom line is they, they have a population that loves their country and have seen the difference between being under Russia's thumb during mm -hmm. the Cold War versus being a free and democratic state. And I love what you were saying about the truckers earlier, because <laughs> they don't get it. There's no. a whole lot more to freedom than just, you know, not wearing a mask. I mean, it's it's defending who you are, what your nation is all about and understanding and respecting other people. That's a long intro, Tara. I'll no, that's that, no, that's that's great because I I that's why we bring you on to hear to hear from you. You have experience and people want to hear that because they don't get that unfiltered um, you know, assessment of what's going on every single day. So, uh the I'm just want to ask you just something about the truckers because before I get into the no-fly zone question. The Ukraine we were talking, truckers? The, no. <laughs> the Russian truckers or our yeah. truckers? Our truckers who okay. are, yeah, they, they wouldn't survive 10 minutes in, in Russia. They they bitch and complain here about how how uh, their, their rights are impeded. They wouldn't last two minutes over there. Um, but this idea of patriotism that has been hijacked from um, the, 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 the idea, it's just been hijacked now by these people. And I think for to hear from you, what, what's your definition of patriotism versus nationalism? Because I don't think what those truckers are doing is patriotism, but they do. Well, they, they have hijacked the term, certainly. And, and a lot of people have hijacked that term, thinking that it means, you know, owning a gun and wearing a T-shirt that says different things on it. But military uh, cosplay, as Rick says. Yeah, yeah. The vet bros. That's for yeah. sure. Um, what, you know, they're, they, they seem to emphasize individual freedoms. And yes, that was certainly a founding feature of our nation, but that also has to be balanced with what our founding fathers taught us, mm -hmm. which is the individual freedoms are only good if you have a, a, a connection to a social contract and social responsibility. You can't have one and not have the other for a democracy to thrive. You know, individual freedoms are important, but the right of the individual only goes so far if the, if the masses, if the majority says, this is the way we'd like to do things. That's so, right. I mean, that, it, it, that's my definition. And it's a love of country and a love of what the country stands for. And for 40 years, you know, I raised my hand and 
and swore to support and defend the Constitution, Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Well, that Constitution really represents ideas and ideals. Mm -hmm. we, we swear to defend a piece of paper that represents who we are and what we are supposed to be doing in terms of, uh, I don't want to get too far into this, but things that are found in speeches and documents throughout our history, our Constitution, our Declaration, the Gettysburg Address, Martin mm -hmm. Luther King's I Have a Dream, Kennedy's uh, inauguration speech, uh, Roosevelt's Four Freedom speech, all of those things contribute to who we are as a nation. And you can't just say, well, it's all about my personal freedom and forget about all the rest of it. That's right. You can't, you don't get to pick and choose. Right. <laughs> uh, they seem to think so, but it, it includes people you disagree with. And that seems to be a concept that is foreign to these people. Um, and it makes them a, a threat to, to our democracy and what our republic stands for. And I think it's time that we took that term back and we took it back and 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 try to remember what it actually means to be a patriot in this country and not and not just uh, surrender it to those people because I think that that's a dangerous thing. They want to bully you into silence and make them think it's normal and normalize what they're doing and it's not. Um, okay, back to Ukraine. Back to Ukraine. A lot of people have said, including my mom, my mom and I got into a very spirited, we call it argubating in our family, a very spirited argubate over the no-fly zone issue. And I'm, I'm glad to see more and more people are talking about this. Will you please explain why a no-fly zone is not a good idea? Well, it, it's, I want to say it's kind of gimmicky. Uh, we have executed no-fly zones in Iraq in northern and southern Iraq, Operation Northern Watch and Southern Watch. We executed them in Libya, uh, we, and we executed it in the Balkans uh, during the Balkan Wars of the late 1990s. But what you have to understand, to execute a no-fly zone, you're basically telling your opponent, the enemy, do not fly aircraft in this zone. If you fly it, we will shoot it down. Well, shooting down an enemy aircraft is in and of itself an act of war, mm -hmm. so you have to be prepared for the consequences of doing that. Um, and, and oh, by the way, in, in those three previous examples, those were relatively small states, that nations that didn't have a very good air force, that also didn't have active air defense, and certainly didn't have nuclear weapons that would, that would cause things to escalate. That's kind of the critical piece. But mm -hmm. what all, people also don't know, to execute the, that no-fly zone, it takes a whole boatload of resources in terms of airplanes, potential rescue uh, helicopters and rescue craft, uh, a, a suppression of enemy air defense. And oh, by the way, the Russians have enemy air defense all over Ukraine right now where they can reach out with some of the most technologically strong missiles if they learn how to fire them and have soldiers that actually pull the trigger. Right. But, but they do have that potential to knock airplanes out of the sky. So those three things weren't very prevalent in those other nations. They were a little bit in the Balkans and in Libya, but truthfully not on the scale that we're seeing it now. But the most important thing I keep going back to is, do we want to, in order to execute a no-fly zone, you have to be prepared to shoot down aircraft that violate the no-fly exactly. zone. Exactly. That's number one. Uh, number two is when you shoot it down, is there an immediate escalation between a regional conflict, Ukraine versus Russia, with unfortunately thousands of people dying, to a global conflict of nuclear superpowers going at each other. That's kind of important to realize. Right. And the third thing I'd say is, you know, when you go to war as a general, you kind of assess your risk. What are things that you have to do and what are things that could harm your force? And then you have to mitigate, mitigate those risks in various ways. When you're talking about the potential for escalation, it then becomes a gamble. You cannot mitigate a gamble. You either win or lose. That's so some, right. people, some people are saying, ah, Russia will never shoot nuclear weapons. Really? Right. Uh, you know, are you willing to take that risk? Are, given are you the lucky punk? You know, right. one, of those, one of those kind of things. <laughs> right. I don't think the Biden administration is ready to take that gamble versus risk just, just yet. And neither is NATO, clearly. And right. you would need unanimity within NATO in order to do that. Um, the other part of this is, what would you say to, there was a letter, 27 folks came out, former ambassadors and, and uh, retired generals like you that said, 
we want to do like a kind of sort of limited no fly zone for humanitarian purposes to you know give protection to these corridors that are supposed to be um, safe zones that Russia and Ukraine have negotiated. Russia hasn't really lived up to that, but it's supposed to give safe passage to the civilian population to get out of these cities. So why can't we just do a limited one where we kind of just monitor things as the civilians are evacuating? I yeah. would assume it's the same risk, right? Well, it's the same risk. Plus, when you do a limited no-fly zone, uh, two things play a part. Number one, has the other side agreed to that limited right. thing? Are they going to let your airplanes fly in their area? And number two, back as a young colonel, I had the opportunity to take an orientation flight in an F-16. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't real cool. I mean, it was kind of cool until I started, you know, yakking because the yeah. pilot was trying to get me to yak. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is there's no, you know, boundaries to the roads in the sky. Mm -hmm. So when you think about a humanitarian corridor, you know, how do you paint that picture of that road in the sky that that no-fly zone goes into after getting permission from the Russians to enter their combat zone. And the third thing is, I forgot the third thing, there are a bunch of artillery rounds and missiles going around all over the place. And there's an expression the Air Force has, big sky, little bullet. Yeah. You know, when, when there's artillery rounds going whizzing past you, you don't know what they're going to hit. That's and you right. prefer not to fly in that area. Sounds to me like you, it's kind of being a little bit pregnant. You can't have a limited no-fly zone in this situation. It's uh, it's all or nothing. And the risks remain the same, I think, as a full-fledged uh, no-fly zone, basically, is what you're telling me. Right. It's not worth the risk. Let me ask you this. Not um, worth the gamble. Well, the, yes, the gamble. Um, this convoy has been something that everyone has been fixated on, including me. I've had my own theories about why it's stalled and what it's doing sitting there. Um, my theory is uh, a little simplistic. I think Putin thought he was going to overrun Kiev and the country and he was going to take over in a couple of days. And then after they took out uh, Zelensky, the convoy was going to go there to occupy Kiev. Well, when that didn't happen as quickly as he thought and things started to break down and soldiers started to desert and the Ukrainians have fought back. They went, holy shit. Okay. Maybe we need to stop and rethink this. And they're just waiting to go in once they take down Kiev. Um, am I close or what do you think is going on with this convoy? There, there are a lot of things going on with this convoy <laughs> and none of them good, by the right. way. Uh, I was asked this about a week when the convoy first popped up and it became the shiny new object that everybody was looking at. Right. I was asked about six times. How come they're not? How come the Ukrainians aren't attacking taking the them out. Right. Yeah. How come they're not taking them out? You know, that's by the way, dating doctrine. You destroy things in the military. You take out girls. Uh, uh, anyway, you know, I explained to them. First of all, it's it's not a valuable target uh, right now. I mean, if if Ukraine had unconstrained resources, if they had aircraft flying uh, multiple sorties every day, if they had the potential for artillery strikes, if they had perfect intelligence or if they had massive amounts of drones, that convoy would have been dust in a short mm -hmm. period of time. But truthfully, if I'm a Ukrainian commander, I'm thinking I got bigger targets I have to engage. I got to engage tanks and artillery pieces and rockets and missiles. And that convoy is just sitting there. Part of what you said is true. First, it's a it's a logistics convoy, which means it has ammo and fuel and gas. All those things are important. Don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but it wasn't going anywhere. It's going to stay there. You know, right. hence everybody paying attention to it for about a week and a half. Right. Third thing, the drivers in those trucks are sitting there freezing their asses off and burning a lot of fuel because they they're keeping their vehicles on. Hey, right. Knock yourself out. And now what we're seeing as the Ukrainian army has brought some territorial, to, some territorial forces and some Ukrainian army forces into the area very surreptitiously, they are picking off those trucks like a, a duck range. Yeah. It's, it's still there, but there are pictures of parts of that convoy that are just exploding. And by the way, some of the Ukrainian soldiers, uh, anecdotally, uh, in a briefing by uh, John Kirby, the Pentagon's press secretary, mm -hmm. he said they have found trucks that have had uh, their gas tanks punctured their tires punctured purposely so mm. they can't roll forward. And the Russian soldiers have deserted from uh, many Russian soldiers from that convoy. Yeah, that's uh, I read something, uh, another fascinating uh, article about the 
the the state uh, the condition of the tanks and all the way down to tires when you talk about right. logistics right? right and how these these tanks and these trucks are not very well maintained and right. that they have really terrible tire chinese made tires and that if you don't move them because you're supposed to move them you know occasionally so they don't some something to do with the tread and the tires or whatever and the pressure but anyway but these chinese tires are really terrible and that they're blowing out left and right and that they're they don't have the supplies the longer this goes on they don't have the supplies to fix these trucks same thing with the with the planes that there's an aviation issue that that's another reason that, another thing we haven't really seen where is this well, this russian air force that they're yeah, worried about that, that they can't you know service them but if I can go to the tires again, that gets yeah. to the discipline issue of the individual soldier. Remember, this this war started on what the twenty third of February. Mm -hmm. Those dudes have been sitting. Those Russians have been sitting in muddy fields in Belarus since September. So if oh, you don't have the sergeants saying, "Go out and check your tires, rotate your tires, run your trucks a little bit. Did you get refueled today?" When they go into battle, and by the way, this is the first time all of them have gone into this kind of battle in very bad conditions, the, the things, you as you can see what I'm painting the picture of, these yeah. things start adding up. Yeah. And it's not good. That's right. Um, is there anything to that theory about the about the Air Force uh, and the planes? Because I that was something I didn't really consider because we're so used to here in the United States that, you know, we own our planes. We don't have to worry about anybody else. No one's going to hold the, the manuals or the aviation parts hostage. But yeah. with Boeing and Airbus now saying we're not doing business with you, um, what happens when the, the Russian Air Force, if it ever starts to deploy in any significant way, they can't fix their planes? Well, there's there's even more problems than that. And. When all of this is over, the military is probably going to do a massive after action review to take mm -hmm. a look at the state of the Russian army. One of the things with the Russian Air Force we're seeing is their pilots are not well trained. They can't fly very well. They don't get the same kind of flight hours that our pilots get. Right. So a lot of them are using things. <laughs> In fact, I saw a picture yesterday where a guy had a, 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 a GPS in a commercial GPS in the cockpit of an air, airplane. They are also- <laughs> Like a Garmin? Yeah, a Garmin, yeah. So, you know, they're, they're finding their way based on a Garmin. And the other interesting piece that is contributing to the casualties, the civilian casualties, is they are dropping almost exclusively dumb bombs. When the U.S. Air Force goes into combat, we're, we're dropping smart precision, ammunition, smart bombs, right. precision they are dropping 500 pounders that have no guidance system that are just falling off the wing of the airplane. And I think that's what's causing some of the, I know that's what's causing some of the civilian casualties as well as a, a purported uh, deliberate uh, killing of civilians. Uh, can you explain what, what the, uh, the, people are worried about the uh, Putin doing what he did to Grozny, right? To Grozny. Yeah. And can you explain why we are fearful of that? Because it looks like Putin is is going to double down before he would ever surrender because he's got he can't afford to lose this war. And a lot of people are hearing this term. We don't want it to to Groznify, uh Kiev or some of these other towns. Um, explain what that is. Yeah, what it is is basically just raising leveling the town, raising R I S I N G uh, a town where you completely level it, and it's a terror tactic to get the civilians out of the town to further psychologically damage the population and then roll in and take control of the city. And it's not that we're concerned about it, it's that we know it's occurring already. Mm -hmm. I mean, there have been multiple towns uh, already that have been raised and leveled uh, and that's creating, you know, the two plus million refugees that have now gone out of the, uh, of the, of the country. You know, and, and that's one of the things from a military standpoint too, Terry, I'll tell you that you know, military folks not only plan for conflict, but they all U.S. military, they also plan for humanitarian operations after a conflict. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a crisis of that epic proportion. We're just seeing the very beginning of it. You know, th this could reach five million refugees in Europe and that could contribute to Putin potentially attempting to reach one of his objective, which is to further divide NATO. But so far, we're seeing the countries of NATO accept these refugees with open arms and a great yes. deal of love, which, by the way, they, now. Didn't, they did not do in Syria uh, for the refugees out of Syria.
That's true. That's a whole different discussion. Yeah. Um, and I, I question, maybe it's the cynic in me, whether Russia is agreeing to these humanitarian corridors um, to evacuate people so they can do exactly what you just said. They get the yeah. civilians out and then they can go in and level the towns. Yeah, um, and, they, and they did that in Syria multiple times. Right, they would, like Aleppo. They would, cert, they would tell a certain town, leave, because we're going to go in there and conduct operations and mm -hmm. go to this town. And they would force them to the next town over and then they do the same thing over and over again. It's monstrous. It's just unbelievable. And and the fact that we have a we have a former president that thinks that that Putin is savvy and a genius doing what he's doing is sickening. And um, that's uh, I don't know why more people don't have a problem with that. Yeah. Um. Before I let you go, and thank you for for educating us. I could talk to you for hours. We've we I've interviewed before, and we always have a great conversation. But um, I wanted to end on a story that you tweeted out about your experience with a Russian general and uh, the Boy Scouts and yeah. Russian graves. Uh, I, please tell that story. Yeah, what happened was I, I was command. I was a one star general commanding at the training center in Grafenbeer, Germany. And uh, we were having an exercise with the Russians. This was in 2004, where we were still partly friendly with them. Right. And the exercise was all about you know, how the Americans and the Russians met each other on the Elbe River at a place called Torgau. And it was actually exercise Torgau. So we invited these Russians to come down and see the exercise. A bunch of generals came in, Russian generals, to see what their troops were doing. And a couple of weeks before that, I had a Boy Scout leader see me in church. And he said, hey, he said, we got a scout project going on. He said, you need to come over and see it. Not even thinking about the Russians. It was a Russian graveyard behind our post gym at Grafenberg. Grafenberg used to be during World War II a German Stalag, so they used mm. to have prisoners of war there. Well, over, I think about 200 or so Russians had died in the Stalag during the war. And uh, uh, so this, we didn't know about this cemetery. I'd never even seen it before, but this Boy Scout leader said, hey, my scouts want to clean it up as an Eagle Scout project. And I said, boy, that'd be great. And when the Russians get here, I could take the general over and show him um, you know, the, the cemetery where all his comrades are buried. Right. You know, and, and it'd be a great honor for him and all that other stuff. Well, the time passed, the general came, I took him over there and, you know, I explained to him and all the scouts were there. I thought he might give him a handshake or something. And all the scouts were there. And, and I told him the story and he, he just looked at me like I was crazy. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, these, these guys were not, if, if they were truly Russians, they would probably not have died or allowed themselves to become prisoners of war. He said they must have been from an inferior Russian country, meaning one of their satellites, which they include Ukraine in that uh, definition. Mm -hmm. So, and he turned around and left. So, you know, I've since been told, yeah, that was a, an insult of his culture and an insult of the art. I don't care. You know, if you don't, if you're a nation that doesn't honor your war dead, there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw a film tonight on the news, Tara, if I can just say this. Sure. Um, uh, they were showing a couple of Ukrainian soldiers who had been killed in combat. And their, their comrades were all there. And they were giving them, the, the deceased soldiers, the kind of ceremony, memorial ceremony, that we used to do, in, that we do in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. The Ukrainian soldiers learned that in Afghanistan because they were part of the ISAF force in Afghanistan, along mm -hmm. with the Poles. Uh, so they saw, how do you honor your dead? And now they're doing it. And we've also seen in some of these films, the Russians are just leaving their dead on the road and not picking them up. So it just tells the difference, not to, not to vilify the Russians, but it certainly is an indicator of what they value and what they don't. That's right, their mindset, which, which speaks to the impact of soft power um, the impact of, of propaganda. I think the Russians have been prosecuting a war for a different time. They have not anticipated the impact of people being able to get the real-time images of what's happening right. there. Um, and Lincoln Project did an ad speaking directly to the Russian mothers about, you know, this who this is the guy, you know, you're sending your 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 children, your sons to die for, for this old man's fantasies of, of days of old here, like what's going on. And the more stories we're hearing about Russian mothers standing up and crying out and we're and the world is, is being beamed out to the world. And the Russians have no answer for this. They're they still think that they're gonna get away with telling people that they're denazifying a country 
um, that has a, a large Jewish population that's saying, what, what are you talking about here? And a Jewish president. It's, right. um, it's insane. Um, anyway, before we go, last word, how do you see this ending? Is, are we looking at a long-term insurgency? Do you think Putin is going to you know, lose it completely? Do you think he's going to use nukes? What, what, how do you see this ha- ending? There, there, in my view, there are all kinds of uh, courses of actions w- which could happen. Um, it, it's, it's my view that Ukraine is going to not only survive, but thrive after this. And I actually see the potential for a 21st century Marshall Plan approach in helping them to recover from this, because I think the nations of Europe will do that. But it, it could be a long time. There's going to be a lot of killing of civilians and a humanitarian crisis of refugees in the near future. Like every American, I want to do more, but I just don't know how right now. And that's tough for a soldier because you, you know usually we're, we like to be in the action, but this is tough. We've got to depend on the Ukrainian army, the Ukrainian territorial forces and the Ukrainian population to win this fight against oppression. Um, are we doing enough? I, I think we are. I think there's a lot. I know there's a lot going on behind the scenes. I know there is because uh, I've talked to folks who are doing it. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know what else we could do, Tara. I mean, that's right. the other thing. I, I get a lot of people tweeting at me saying, how come we don't do this? How come we don't do that? Right. It's, you can't. It's yeah. outside the realm of the possible. But uh, and it's hard. It, like you said, it's hard because we're watching this in our living rooms, which right. is unlike anything we've ever really seen other it, it than is. even it's the horrific. even you know, in Afghanistan and Iraq, we didn't have it every m- moment like we do now. And right. it's, it's tough. You're right. It is horrific. But the other piece I'll just say, and how do I see this end? The wild card is what is Vladimir Putin going to do? Is he going to admit defeat? Probably not. The CIA said he wouldn't today. Yeah. Um, is he going to do something even crazier than what he's doing? Or is he going to continue to level cities and, and prove himself increasingly day to day a war criminal, a, cr- a thug, and a horrific human being and cement his reputation as that? I think that's probably what he's going to do. I hope he doesn't go to the next level. Um, but I don't know. I can't say. Yeah. When, and the world is watching with yeah. bated breath. Yep. Retired General Mark Hurtling, thank you so much for spending time with me and our viewers. As always, it is a pleasure, my friend. It's always a pleasure, Tara. Thanks for what thanks for what you're doing. And again, happy International Women's Day. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, so much. I, and General Hartling has so many great stories. Uh, that's why when I every time I interview him, it's about something different. And uh, he never, never disappoints, never disappoints. But it's tough. Um, but we thank him for his service. He is now that's a true patriot. All right, everyone. Well, that's it for our show tonight. Be sure to check out our sister show. We're speaking tomorrow. And on Thursday, we will continue the conversation with David Rothkoff about some of the geopolitical, um, ramifications of what's going on and what's happening. Will, will Putin fall? What's, what is this going to look like on the world stage? So stay tuned for that on Thursday and on Tuesdays, for those who know, then follow Tiki on Instagram at Tara's Tiki Cat. It's Tiki Tuesday. So if you want to ask questions of Tiki, go on over to Instagram, like him, follow him, and Tiki will answer some of your questions. All right. Again, happy International Women's Day and praying for Ukraine. See you next time.